Look at, if you would, with me here in this session on choosing Christ-honoring music in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible, most famous verse in the Bible on this subject. You could probably name some, but I think this is one we think of most, and you might just mark this in your Bible. How many of you are interested in music? It's so much that you sing regularly or you play an instrument re regularly. Could you raise your hand? Well, I see that day several hands going up. Very good. And I appreciate you being in, in this uh, session. There are other sessions dealing with music. I hope you'll take the opportunity uh, to be a part of on, on how to play an instrument for the Lord. That's a pretty, pretty interesting topic, and uh, we'll, we'll have some things dealing with that. But here we're just talking about really choosing Christ-honoring music. Or could I say it this way? Because all of your music, let's just be honest for one second. Can we be honest? Is that going to shock anybody if we're honest? We've already tr I've been trying to shock you already today. It's not working, and so I've been striking out. But let's try, let's try to shock you again. You know, probably every, every CD, everything you have in an iPod, every way you would listen to music, maybe you have something in your phone, probably everything in there doesn't come from the hymn book at church. Would that be a true statement? You can just nod your head ever so slightly. I, I won't even tell anybody. It's true. But it's true, isn't it? Not all that music comes from the hymn book. Not all of it comes from one particular place. And so you are really in the process and have the ability to choose your music every day. And I don't, I don't think anyone expects you to just have a, a church hymn book and that's the only songs that you're, you're singing, looking at, never would do anything else that's there. And so you're going to, and plus people are writing new songs all the time that are not available maybe in your church hymn book, and you're having to say, wow, is this song something I should have as a part of my music library that's going to be coming into my ears, into my mind, into my heart, and then influencing me the way it will? You have to make decisions. It's like Brother Paulie said in his message, we can't, I can't give you a list like this song's bad, this, this singer, songwriter bad, avoid them. I'm not going to do that in this meeting. And I would never do that. I don't think it's my place to do that. So I can't tell you, uh, this is the, I put a black piece of paper over here with all the bad things on it and a white piece of paper over here with all the good things and good people and good songs on it and say, well, that's it. Don't worry about it. Don't think. Forget what the Holy Spirit can do in your heart. You, you just listen to me. I'll tell you what you need to do. That's the way a lot of people think. Now, that's kind of nice right now because you all are a little bit younger in this meeting. And I understand that. And you're kind of used to somebody telling you what to do. Somebody says, you got to get up at this time. You need to wear these clothes. You're going to eat this for breakfast. You're going to eat this for lunch. You're going to eat this for supper. If you want a snack, you're going to have this for a snack. If you want to have a, have something to drink, this is exactly what it's going to be. These are the shoes you're going to wear. Well, you know what? I hate to, I hate to tell you this. There's coming a day when nobody's going to tell you that. And, you're, and it is going to be like a wonderfully liberating day, but it's also going to be a day when you're going to have to do a lot more thinking. You know, some of us aren't as gifted in the area of matching our clothes. <laughs> you, you know, there's some people like that in this world. That don't look at anyone, please, in this room. People are like, oh, yeah. But don't look at anybody. But right now you're looking at me, so now I'm getting nervous again. But, yes, it, it, some of us have trouble with that. And so it was great when my mother was saying, here you go. These shoes, these pants, and this shirt will work, son. And I was like, fine. But there came a day where I kind of had to go into the closet myself and say, well, these shoes, these pants, this shirt, will it work? I don't know. And I've gone out and gotten out somewhere and thought, have mercy, it's not working. Uh, you know, in, in the light of the bedroom, it looked okay. Well, I walked out like outside in the sunlight, and all of a sudden, these clothes don't match. I have to think for myself is what I'm trying to say. Uh, gentlemen, I know I'm still I'm talking about something that just doesn't resonate with you. The ladies have already figured this out, but most of us guys, bottom line, guys, when we get married, my wife took over that job, and I thank God that she has a ministry to me, helping me that way before I walk out of the house and embarrass myself too much. But what am I saying all that for? Because you have got to become someone who thinks and uses the principles of the Bible to make right decisions. And, a, and your pastor and your youth director, a person like me who's a music director, can't just can't be sitting with you in the car all the time or in your room all the time or, uh, or here all the time and saying, no, 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 no. You know, I have a six-year-old, and that doesn't work with him very well. We have an eight, a nine-month-old that's starting to work with him. He's figured that word out already. We've had to use it a little bit. And so, but, but now you're older than that. We can't do that. The Lord doesn't intend for you to live your life. He wants you to live it in liberty, making the decisions to choose him. That's what God has intended for you. I'm saying a lot, and I, and I don't want to. I don't want to overwhelm you, but this is this is what Brother Paulie was speaking about today. You know, when we we do this one thing and we find our time and our place in and with Christ, then all the decisions in our life um, can be made correctly. Even the decisions about your music. 
So look here at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 with me, if you don't mind. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I'll say that one more time. It's a wonderful verse. You ought to commit it to memory. It's not, not difficult. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, Christ-honoring music is, is definitely the music we should be singing in our church meetings. And we pray that the Lord is honored. I, str- I struggle with that myself. I have the opportunity to work with the music here to help our pastor. By the way, in the church setting, I believe that our pastor is the real music director, and we're doing the things that we pray would encourage him, would honor him, would help him as he prepares to preach. He's the one that has to stand and speak. I'd hate to do something that would discourage him and where he had, for, had difficulty there. So we're trying to do things to help him. But we want to do things that honor the Lord. There's a principle throughout all of our music that we would find if I took you back to Psalm 19. It talks about that entire chapter. talks about the, the glory of God. In our music, we want to have an, an abiding principle that we would declare the glory of God in our lives. And uh, where it says there in Psalm 19, 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And so, you know, our music has such an influence there. Uh, the, the Scottish poet Carlyle said this, Let me determine the music of a nation, and I, don't, I care not who makes its laws. Let me determine the music of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. So you can have laws, but did you know that music and media and entertainment can, can override that? There was, a, there was a day in our country when the, the popular music of our day, the things that are going on in different styles of music, hip-hop, rap, whatever, popular music, they could not be done without people being arrested, <laughs> literally. I can remember a day way back in a different dispensation, way back in the 1980s when I was a younger man. That was my, my, my time in high school. You're looking at me and go, yeah, I, I can, well, you're probably surprised. You probably thought it was the 1970s or 60s, but it was the 1980s. And um, I can remember reading in the newspaper about a, a rap group, a hip-hop group, being arrested in a location, a popular group being arrested in a location, I think it was in Florida, but they were arrested because they were doing things that were against the law in that county, lewd things, saying things. They were obscene things, and they were literally taken off the platform, off the stage in the middle of their performance because they broke the laws. Today we can't imagine that. I mean, that's how people make their living today. The more obscene, the more outrageous they are, the, the more that's become an industry, has it not? Would you say that? You know better than I do about it. And so to, what the, he said, let me determine the music of a nation. I don't care who makes its laws. There are laws on those laws haven't changed, but they're not even enforced anymore because laws tend to follow the morality of the people. Let's put it this way, the enforcement of the law. Are you still with me? So you might even have the law in the book because somebody, but somebody says, well, that's not a righteous, it's not a good law. People should be able to say whatever they want, do whatever they want. Well, there's a limit to our law and to our liberty there. But because of that, people could go and do lewd, lewd, awful, what very sinful things that are against God and things that are even against nature. And, um, and they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be against the law. Let me determine the music of a nation. I don't care who makes its laws. Quite an influence to say that 20 years ago, people were being arrested for things that people are making millions of dollars doing today. That's how influential it all is. And you and I can be influenced that way. You know, music is important. It's important in our church meetings. Martin Luther made the statement that, that every young man who's training for the ministry ought to be well exercised in music. And I'd encourage you, even if you don't think you're going to be in music, you ought to have some training, some understanding of it, just so you can honor God with it and do things the right way. But music is a noble gift of God next to theology, Luther said. Music's a noble gift of God next to theology. Now, if we want Christ honoring music in our in our churches and in our homes and in our hearts, think about what we could do. According to this verse, look back at this verse with me. You're still with me, Colossians 3.16? That's a good place to say yes. Good, good. I appreciate you whispering that. I appreciate it. And in Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let's talk about the lyrics for a moment. Words. It's a little bit easier with the words. If we're going to say, is this song acceptable in the church house? Is this song acceptable in my house? Now think about the words, and I think there are different things, and there have to be times when things are appropriate, but it says, let the word of Christ dwell in your rich and all wisdom. Songs, really, I believe that, that the lyrics, the words of the songs, and by the way, let me make this statement for a minute. A song, what is a song? It's words, typically it's words and music married together to make a song. So when I talk about a song, maybe it's a little bit different. I'm going to split things up between lyrics and music for a minute. 
Most people talk about the words and never talk about the music. We're going to get to that. That's very controversial. We're going to try to get to that in just a minute. And we'll see if you have a question that maybe I can or cannot answer, and I'll have to defer it to someone who's smarter in the room, but I'll try my best. But let's think about the words for a moment. If we want, especially the words in church, because there are a lot of a lot of different kind of songs making it into our church house, right? And it's, you can tell, tell things are changing sometimes, and, and it's for, not for the good. It's usually for the bad. Usually not for the good. It's for the bad. It says, what are we going to do? Let's have four principles from this verse that help us with Christ honoring music as far as the lyrics are concerned. The first principle it should be that a song that honors Christ that's supposed to be for Jesus should be correct in doctrine. The word of Christ. Let the word of Christ. Word. That's the Bible, God's word, doctrine. Doctrine is our belief and teaching. It comes from the Bible. It's what we things that we know to be true about God we find in the Bible. And what those our theology will affect, affect our philosophy. So we, the way you and I behave, what we believe, our philosophy comes out of our theology, which is what we know to be true about God. So if we're going to have Christ honoring music, then it should be correct in doctrine. So it says, let the word of Christ. And so, but you know, bad doctrine, wrong doctrine, I should say, gets into songs. Why do you think songs have incorrect doctrine in them? And there are some songs that are even in our hymn books that, that really have, maybe, maybe they're songs that make you think that you can't, be, you can't have eternal salvation. Did you guys somehow earn your way to heaven? Sometimes there's songs that just get things confused, like uh, that 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 uh, you know in the in the scriptures people get this confused a lot. Uh, that with the types in the scripture, and we sing a song on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I'm bound for the promised land. Well, typically in the Bible, when we're talking about crossing over Canaan, crossing over Jordan into Canaan, that's the that's the walking into the fullness of the Christian life. It's not necessarily the picture of going to heaven. So songs like that have some are not correct. I'm not saying it's evil, but it's not correct in its picture. Uh, I, there's a song I love to sing around. that We sing around here occasionally, and um, maybe we shouldn't. I don't know, but it says, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Well, in the Bible, when they crossed Jordan, they crossed over into Canaan land, the promised land. It's not. It wasn't a picture of heaven. Did they still have people to fight in Canaan when they got there? Did they still have struggles in Canaan? Well, that's not a picture of heaven. I understand what people are trying to say, but we can be more correct in what we're doing. And I would encourage you to this. A lot of times you get in a session like this. I know I'm saying a lot, but people would start throwing arrows and shooting bullets at people who are singing contemporary music and, and certain type, like Christian rock music, those kind of things. And I'm not saying those things are right, but before you ever start looking outside the walls, look inside the walls to make sure what you're doing is correct. I think we have to make sure that we're on the right page and doing what the Lord wants before we start criticizing or trying to correct others. I know that's a mistake I've made. So number one, Christ-honoring music should, should be correct in doctrine. Number two, there's, look at the end of that phrase, let the word of Christ, Christ. So number two, the word of Christ, that phrase says that, that the song should exalt deity. I'd like you to write this down if you would. I want to give it this way where you would and write in your Christian Life Journal. If you would, I'm sorry I don't have a handout for you today, but it should exalt deity, especially the second person of the Trinity. The name, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love to talk about this. He's the, he is the, that's his full name, Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lord. He's the master, the ruler, creator of all. He was there at creation. And it tells us in John 1.1. 1, 1. And then it is Jesus. In Matthew, in, in there early in Matthew, it said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Jesus is the Savior. And he's the Christ. Christ means Messiah and an, or anointed one. He was the one they were looking for from the first part of Genesis there. Some 4,000 years before he arrived on earth, there was a promised Messiah, Genesis 3.15. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and the lamb was slain in the garden? And there was a promise in Genesis 3.15 that there would, be, there would be one who would come and crush Satan's head. That was Jesus. And they were looking for him, looking for him, looking for him, looking for him. He was born. The Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 8, 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who hath set thy glory above the heavens. See, the Lord has a precious name. And the songs that we sing, especially in our church meetings, ought to be clearly about him. Now, we don't see Jesus' name in a lot of, a lot of songs. Not as many as we should. It's a lot easier to use a pronoun, because pronouns rhyme a lot easier, <laughs> than the name of Jesus. How many of you have ever tried to write a song or write some poetry? Everybody has. They just won't all raise their hand. We're afraid you're gonna. I'm, you're afraid I'm gonna ask you to share some of it. No, I've done the same thing, but I wouldn't ever let you see it either. You'd really, you'd laugh at me forever. But it's not easy to write poetry to make things rhyme. 
That's one reason we see uh, incorrect doctrine coming is because people are, have a rhyme scheme that they're trying to honor instead of honoring the right theology. And sometimes people don't can't use the name of Jesus clearly in a psalm because it's a lot easier to rhyme with he or him. I say exalt his name. His name is worthy to be praised. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for our sins, the one who paid it all on Calvary, the one who's ever liveth to make, whoever liveth to make intercession for us. I can't, I, we must be clear. Now, understand if you're singing in church and you're singing a song that says he, most people probably know you're singing about the Lord Jesus. But let's be clear about that. And um, truthfully, sometimes, it's, 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 this sounds a little funny, but it, you could use those same songs and sing them to your boyfriend. Because you don't even, you, you, I love him. He loves me. <laughs> well, who is he? Tell me who him is. Okay? We need to be clear. Always set that. You know, remember your grammar class? You had an antecedent for the pronoun. Remember that? Sorry to bring up grammar in this setting. I apologize. It is summertime, and we know we shouldn't do that, but I have to. All right? The antecedent for the pronoun. Let's have the name of Jesus clear there and make sure that if you want Christ on our music, according to this verse, let the word, the doctrine be right, of Christ, the deity, be high. Lift him up. And by the way, we say, well, well, we keep saying the name of Jesus. That's offensive. Well, Jesus said this. He said, if I be lifted up, what? I will draw all men unto me. The most attractive thing about your music in your church or about the music in your life or, the, or anything that you'll do for Jesus is, when, is, is Jesus himself, not you, not how well you sing or how well you do a piece of music. The attractive thing is going to be Jesus. And he's promised to honor that. Isn't it funny? We want to give people everything else and think that's how we're going to get them here. But all we have to do is give them Jesus. And he is attra he's the most attractive thing in any of our lives, and he is the one that will draw. He draws people to himself. You and I don't do that. He uses us, but he draws people himself. So make much of Jesus in your music and make much of his name. So exalting deity, make it clear that's who we're talking about. And by the way, a little side point there, don't take his name in vain. I, I'm, I worry about that in, in music. You say, well, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain is just commonplace. We live in a society that doesn't honor God, but you hear the name of God all the time, don't you? Usually it's because people are saying, OMG. Not because they're saying, oh, God, I need you, or God, I love you. They're saying something crazy has happened. They're saying, OMG. It's all over the place. I watch TV, uh, extreme makeover on TV. Somebody walks in and sees the brand new house. The first words out of their mouth, OMG. Right? Am I right about that? You hear it all the time. Somebody drops a glass of water, that's what they say. Somebody forgets some, their keys in the house, that's the first thing they say. And God delivers from that. We live in a society where people are taking the Lord's name in vain, but I think with us, we don't do that because we get in trouble. Right? If that slipped out of your mouth, have mercy. If that has slipped out of my mouth at home and it did once or twice, excuse me, I'm sorry I'm not perfect, uh, people in authority dealt with it in a very humbling in a, could I say, violent way. And so I got, it, I, got, I got it out of my system. They got it out of my system. They beat the sin out of me. Yes. All right, so, but you and I don't say that stuff, God, because God convicts us when we do. I hope you don't. And I know, I know it's words are habits we form, but um, then how many times have I got up and just saying, like, I love the Lord with all my heart, but my heart was far away from him. I know I'm guilty of that. You don't know it when I am or when I'm not. But God knows. And I even talk about it now and get convicted about it. Because I don't want to be a fake or a phony. I want to be real and I want to exalt the name of Jesus. I want to love Jesus. And I don't want to be something in front of people that I'm not with him in private. And God help me with that. And I, so I could even be a person who's singing in vain, even singing about the, my love for God in vain when I've allowed my lips to do service without my heart being near to him. Be careful about that because you and I who sing and do these these instruments like you guys raise your hand about, we have to get up and almost like perform sometimes when we don't feel like it and we we haven't done right. And um, we got to work on it, don't we, to, to make sure we exalt the name of Jesus. Oh, my. And then look here in the verse. So um, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Look, the third point would be dwell in you richly. The song, The word should have real depth. You know, uh, a lot of people criticize a lot of, like, uh, modern choruses and praise choruses because they're just repetitious and they, they repeat one single phrase. But the song should have real depth, but I don't think repetition is the problem. It's not the whole problem. Yeah, we repeat phrases. There's no question about that. But repetition isn't the problem. So it should have real depth. So number one, we said you uh, have correct doctrine. Number two, you say exalted. Number three, it should have real depth. And that doesn't mean the words just don't repeat. 
because we repeat words all the time. Ever like we sang, we sang song today, and we repeated the chorus a couple of times. We even repeated the verse. We pre- repeated certain phrases in that song several times. Uh, one of my favorite, one of the favorite courses everybody likes to sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Well, that was, that's a two phrase deal. <laughs> Two phrases repeated. One's repeated three times, one's repeated twice. But nobody said, would say, that's a shallow song. Why? Because there's real meaning in what's being said there. So it's not just a repetition of words. It's, it's that it has no real depth in the meaning in it. So it should have real depth. And make sure you look at that in the music that you're singing in your churches, in your youth groups, in your youth choirs, and even things you're taking into your own life. We're talking about the words. And then the last thing I'll say about this, especially with what we're singing in the church house, is that it needs to fit a, fit a biblical category. Number four, it fits a biblical category. Still with me? So it, it is correct in doctrine, exalts deity, is real depth, and then it fits a biblical category. According to Colossians 3.16, it says psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Psalms are from the Bible, the Old Testament song book of ancient Israel. And all 150 psalms were singable and sung. You and I can't don't do that today. But up until just a couple hundred years ago, that's what God's people all did. Now, one thing about it, those songs were meant to be accompanied. If you take a look in the Old Testament, a lot of wonderful, interesting, unique instruments there that were played. So that's fine. Some people say, get all the instruments out and we can honor God. Well, I understand what they're saying because sometimes some certain instruments lend themselves to certain things. But, but they were intended to be played, instruments played with these songs. Hasn't always been done. And then we started to see the progress of hymns a couple hundred years ago. So you have psalms and hymns. What are hymns? They're songs usually that are a little more objective and take us and point us directly to God himself. Um, and they talk to God. Maybe it's a prayer to God or something praising or giving, ascribing his attributes. You know, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. That's a true hymn ascribing greatness to God. Or, oh, worship the king, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his power and his love. Those kind of things uh, are, would be like hymns, but they're basically sung directly to God. By the way, the, uh, who is the audience of all of our singing and our music and our playing? What is it? It should be God himself. He's the only audience. There are a lot of other people spectating, but he's the only audience. So psalms, hymns, and so what are spiritual songs? That's kind of a, mm, what is that? Spiritual songs. I'll say this. I don't know everything about it, but I could, I could tell you this if you'll take it in. A spiritual song doesn't make its first appeal to your carnal or your flesh. It makes appeal to the spirit. wish you had more time to talk about it, but you're a spirit, soul, and body. That's what, how you're made up. Second, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 gives us that divine order of tripartite man. We're three parts, spirit, soul, body. We're not body, soul, spirit. That's not the order. The order God made us in spirit, soul, body. When you, were, when, you became, when you got saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then your spirit was made alive. It was quickened from the dead. When Christ came to live in and dwelled in you by the power of his Holy Spirit, then you, you became alive. You were dead. In fact, think about this today. People who don't know the Lord are not whole. They're not a complete person. They're incomplete. Their body's functioning. They have a soul with the seat of their emotions, but their spirit is dead. Because there's no Christ living in them. They can't be complete. They can't be whole. They can't be complete. They can't really find joy and happiness without Christ. And thank God if you know him, then you have found that. If not, you don't have it. You don't have it. But, again, spirit, soul, and body. And the, the, the spiritual song should appeal. A lot of times they're songs of testimony. One of my favorite songs of testimony is I'm a Child of the King. It's in the hymn book, but it's a song of testimony. Many of those songs are in there like that, but... Um, I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. It's a song of testimony. There are lots of songs. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. You hear a lot of personal pronouns. I'm sorry about the grammar again, but a lot of personal pronouns in those songs. And the songs of testimony. And there are other songs, and they're not even in the hymn book, but they're okay. They're spiritual songs, and they're a lot, a lot of times songs of testimony. Those are the lyrics. Did you get that? That's a good place to say yes or no or uh, whatever you're able to formulate at this point. Some of you can't do much more than grunt. It's a holy grunt, I'm sure, but uh, it's not much more than that. Now what about now the words? Are, do you let me tell me? And would you please tell me? Because a lot of times people like me have gray hair and thinning hair, and 
you know, holding on to what good looks I have left and all that. The people like me, we think we know it all, and we say, we say, we say certain things. But I think when it comes to lyrics, whether it's in church music or it's the music you listen to outside of church, it's easy to figure out these words. <laughs> these words are good, and these words are not so good. Is that true? Is, is it on the lyric side? I hear people preach about that, but it's very easy to me. It's easy for anybody. Excuse me for saying it, with half a brain to listen to a song, whether it's a, a Christian song or a not a Christian song, and say, "These words don't work. These words don't do enough, or these words are really inappropriate, or these words really don't do justice to who Jesus is." Am I right in saying that, or do you find yourself being a little confused by that? Yes, no, or maybe. If someone could tell me, I would love you forever. I'm right. Am I right about that? Seriously? So it's not hard to figure out yes on this song because these words are okay, or no on these songs because these words are not okay. Whether it's called a Christian song or a non-Christian song, am I okay to assume that? Now, if you say yes. I'm going to use this as my market research. I'm going to tell everybody from here on out. I've talked to teenagers. I know what they're thinking because they tell me. They tell me things they don't tell other people. But as far as the words, you'd agree with that, yes? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say no. And so the ayes have it. It's carried. I just want to make sure I'm correct. I, that's how I think, but I'm much older than you. I know you can't tell it by looking at me, but much older than you. And so I just need to have that reaffirmed by you. But now let's talk about the music in the last few minutes we have left because that is hard. What's it supposed to sound like? Would you agree with me? Let's take another. Let's ask question number two in our market research survey here today. This is official stuff. I mean, I'm going to take this to the ends of the earth now. So it's serious. I don't know if anybody will let me come to the end of the earth. But wherever I go, I will be talking. That's for sure. I uh, wake up talking, I go to sleep talking, and I, I think I talk in my sleep what I've been told. But I will be talking about this, and I'll be using you as my research model here. So when it comes to how the music should sound, piano, should there be guitars, should there be drums, should there be cymbals, should there be whatever, I can't think of another instrument, should there be spoons, I mean, there should never be spoons. But... um. By the way, I, I was in a church in South Carolina. I grew up in a church where a young man stood up and played the spoons for an offertory. It was pretty amazing. He played a hymn with the spoons. I don't know how he did it. His name was Billy. I'll remember it forever. But I, he did it. I know he did it. I saw it and heard it with my eyes and ears. I saw it happen. So it can be done. But whatever instrument, do you ever have questions about, is that instrument right? Or why don't they play that instrument? Why do they say you can't play that one? Anybody ever have questions or thoughts about that? Am I right to assume that most people are really don't know what to do about instruments or about the sound of the music or how the music should be played. Would it be okay to assume that? Thank you. I'm, I'm just having to pull it out of you. I so, I'm sorry for making you speak to me, but it helps me. It helps me tremendously. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. What about music? Music is made up of three elements. You need to get this now. This is going to help you. I promise you it's going to help you. I don't know everything, but I've talked about this and thought about this a lot, and I think I can help you. Because it's confusing to me, too, and I want to get it right. I want it, I know this. I want to do the right thing. I don't know about you. But I didn't always do the right thing. But, I, I, but I'd get in trouble or, or I'd come, you know, the Lord would convict me. I'd say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I do want to do right. And I'm looking at people who I think want to do the right thing. I don't think you just want to come up with some excuse to do anything you want to. And like you say, I want my music just to sound like this. I don't care if God likes it or not. I don't think I'm looking at people like that. There are a lot of people out there, and I'd like to talk to them. I don't want to condemn them. I want to talk to them, see if I can help them, and maybe they can help me. You're helping me today by making me understand some things. But what should it sound like? Music has three elements. Melody, that's the tune, and they're really ranked in this order. Melody's the tune, so if I hum the tune, uh, Da 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 What did I just hum? Oh, you got it right. You you guys are so intelligent. It's remarkable. I'm just out of my league here. I know. But anyway, if you if but melody's the tune and it's very recognizable. By the way, when you're playing an instrument, that melody ought to be primary and very distinguishable, so people know what song you're playing. You're playing an instrument. You'll get that in another session. But then you have harmony. Anybody sing harmony here? Sing alto, sing tenor. 
sing bass. Good. I would like to be a bass singer. I can hear bass. I want to be a bass singer. But I can't do it. Just can't do it. <laughs> Just can't do it. Early in the morning, uh, you know, or when I'm sick, I'm a great bass. Other than that, I don't get sick very often, so it doesn't happen. So saying that, now I'll probably be ill tomorrow. But anyway, I'm not a bass singer. Not a bass singer I like to be. But, but harmony is something that accompanies the melody. It's secondary in its importance, but it's something that makes it more beautiful. Usually it's a third above, a third below. Uh, when I sing in trios, we try to we try to do that. Just like one or two no, two notes above, two notes below. We're making it tight, and it sounds. We had a trio sing earlier today. They sang beautifully, just like that. And uh, we hope we keep having that kind of music. We're working on the teen choir this week, and we're working on harmony parts, alto, tenor, uh, and bass. Other other things can be written with that. So the harmony is secondary, but it supports and beautifies. And then you have the rhythm. What's the rhythm? What's rhythm? The beat. It's the beat. By the way, did you know every single song has a beat? Happy Birthday had a beat. It had a rhythm. Amazing Grace has one, too. So rhythm's not evil. But it's not the most important thing. A song should have melody rank number one, harmony rank number two, and rank number three would be the rhythm. So have you ever heard somebody say, that music's good or that music's bad? It's very difficult. You ever heard anybody argue about whether music's good or bad? I'm talking about the sound of it, not the words. We can sit down. The words, oh, yeah, those words are bad. He's saying bad words, profane words. I'm not listening. We shouldn't listen to that. I shouldn't. You might feel like you want to, but you know you shouldn't. Well, when you hear the music, you're like, you, somebody would say, well, that music stinks. And somebody would say, well, I love the sound of that music. So I said, that's bad music. Bad. Really bad. So I said, well, I think it's good. I like it. I like it. And so you got people all the time just, just arguing about the sound of music. Have you ever heard a lot of people argue about it? Yes, no, maybe. Again, my third question in my market research survey here today, I'm going to use you as my guinea pigs. What have, you, have you heard a lot of people arguing about, I don't like the way it sounds. Or they might say, yeah, the words are good, but the sound is horrible. You ever heard anybody say that? Now, you, have you ever been in a discussion with an older person about that? Someone much older than me, I'm sure, but... You've been in, a, been in a discussion with them, and you had an opinion, they had an opinion. And you couldn't come to, basically at the end of the day, the person with the money has the power. So uh, when they say, you ain't doing it, excuse me, again, bad grammar, I'm trying to make you more comfortable. You ain't doing it because they got the money and they own the house, then you ain't doing it, right? But they didn't really win the argument. They just have the power. They didn't win it in your heart or mind. Well, I say this, and when you, when I I want to I want to talk to people many times who don't believe like I do about what music should sound like. Can I just go to them and mean say your music is bad, bad, and start right there with them? N not really, not if I want to continue to have a conversation. Look, your music stinks. It's of the devil. Now let's sit down and talk about it. You're like, well, sorry, I'll see you later. Now, some people might listen to me if I'm imposing enough. My own son would listen to me, I'm sure. Again, because I have the power and I have the money and I own the house. And unless he wants to live on the front yard, he's going to have to listen to what I say. I'll probably put him in the backyard. But, but yeah, he's going to have to listen. So, for me, let's, talk, let's stop saying good and bad for a little while. Can I get you all in favor of, of, of that? Would you please say aye? That's probably a good thing for you because most time people tell you it's bad. So you'd love to hear somebody not say that, but I'm not trying to do it for that reason. I'm thinking about what it should sound like. Is Music is good or bad based on whether it follows those rules for music, primary melody, secondary harmony, and then an underpinning of rhythm. When the rhythm jumps on top, you have really bad music. A, a non-Christian who is a music, musician would say, that's entertainment, but it's not good music. So just a beat, which is rap, what is called rap music. That's not my personal favorite style of music at all. Not at all. But I would say, I wouldn't say it's bad music just because I would think it's evil, but really it's bad music because it's just rhythm. It's not even rhythm. It's not even music. It's just rhythm. It doesn't have melody. It doesn't have harmony. It just has rhythm. So it's, it's bad music. So I would say this. Something's bad based on whether it follows God's universal rules for music. But when, when I'm getting down to it, really at the end of the day, I can say this for sure. You know what? Everybody would agree with it. Let's bring them all in. We'll bring in Pastor Sexton. We'll bring in Brother Paulie on this side. We'll bring in some people that, that know some things about music. Maybe your church music director and have him stand right here. The guy that leads the choir, does the singing there. And then let's bring people in on the other side, though. Let's bring in uh, let's bring in whoever. Let's bring in Lady Gaga. Let's bring in somebody else 
whoever. And they're, you know what they're going to say? They're going to disagree about what music you can listen to. But the one thing that they'll agree with, like she would agree with way over here, and she's way out there from what they tell me. And then over here, these people over here that are way over here, and I know, I know, they're, I know where they're at. You know what they would agree about? They would disagree about good and bad music, but they would agree about the fact that music is very influential. Very. I'm talking about the sound of it. It's very influential. In fact, I remember somebody telling a story one time. They were, in a, they were in a doctor's office, and they were sitting there, and, of course, somebody was across the room not feeling well. You ever been in a doctor's office, and you knew there were sick people with you in the waiting room? You were just worried you are going to get something worse while you are waiting to be helped? And um, you have to get more shots be- than you thought you needed before you got there because there are sick people, like, all around you. <laughs> you know, all over you. But um, she was sitting there. She said, I looked across the way. There was some music playing at the doctor's office. I guess it was a little more upbeat than normal. Usually at the doctor's office, you could take a nice little nap based on the music. But um, she said something was going on. And the guy was, like, literally asleep, but his foot was twitching to the music. Well, he was asleep. They had to wake him up to take him back to the doctor in the back. But he was when he was asleep, he was moving. M- music's influential. I, have a, I keep referring to my young son. Nobody had to teach him how to dance. Four, five, six years old. I mean, when something came on, he was moving all around. You know, he just couldn't help himself. And uh, much better than I just did it, by the way. I think I just hurt something, by the way. But, but um, I'm not getting way too old for that. But music's very influential. Well, so it, you can you can tell to somebody it's okay to keep saying that's good and that's bad. Talking about the sound of it. But you're going to find yourself in a lot of fruitless arguments. But you could say to somebody, well, that music, is that sound is sure influence. It's influencing me. It's influences a lot of people. Then ask the question, does that sound, this the sound, whatever the instruments are, name them, drums, guitars, whatever they are. That's how we say it in the South, guitars. Do those things influence you away from the Lord? I don't, I'll say this, and this could be controversial. I don't think every song has to drive you closer to God. I don't want to break anybody's heart there. I don't think because there are some songs that are just kind of songs that have, that's not their intention. They're not They're not saying anything evil. They're not making you do anything evil. They're not making you think anything evil. But you'd never bring them into church. You know, she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. I don't think that's an evil song, but I don't think we're going to sing that one in church either. doesn't make me do anything evil. I'm sure that's not number one on your, you know, your iTunes list. But, but um, so there are songs like that. You see what I'm saying? Just ask somebody, the sound of that song, is that pulling you, is it making you think of the Lord or draw you away from the Lord? Is it making you closer with the Lord or pulling you away from the Lord? Just the sound of it. That means it's influential. And I'll tell you what, you'll get out of the argument, that's good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad. Your parents could get further with you if they looked you right in the face and said, and so you said that music is bad. Don't turn it on again. They may have to do it. Excuse me. You can tell I've done that a few times. <laughs> but, um, or it's been done to me, actually. But um, they might say, they might ask a question, does the sound of that music make you feel closer to God? That's like, whoa, <laughs> what are you going to say? You, if you want to be honest, that's the best question to ask, isn't it? So music has certain elements. Music is influential. And to me, I'm ready to stop arguing about good and bad music because if there's a person, if there's ten people, there are ten opinions. Did you know that? And um, if there are, Ten women, there might be twenty opinions. I don't know. There's it gets to be even more. Excuse me, ladies. Forgive me for saying that. I should not have said that. I'm glad my wife's not here, but please don't tell her if she's here. Um, so there are a lot of opinions. If there's an older person in the room, there's an opinion. Younger person, there's an opinion. But if we will agree to submit ourselves to Christ and say we're filled with the Spirit of God, our spirit's been made alive, then I know music's influential. Just the sound of it, the way I play the piano, the way I play the guitar, the way I play the trumpet, the way I play the saxophone, the way I play the flute, the way I play the violin, whatever. Is that, are those sounds, sounds that God would accept? Are those sounds, sounds that make me closer to the Lord? Even if it's a non-Christian song, is that sound bringing me close, you know, further from the I don't think that song is in town. I don't think coming around the mountain is going to bring me closer to God, no matter how reverently we sing it. She'll be coming around the mountain. But is it drawing me away from him? And that song does. And obviously, of course, we don't listen to it every day, thank goodness. But other songs that you may hear. So I want you not to feel guilty when you don't have to be. And I want you to do, but I want you to do right. Let me say one more thing and I'll be done. Are you, get, are you catching anything I'm saying, by the way? I hope it's helping you. I'm trying to deliver it the clearest way I can. 
It's a little bit complicated. I actually spend weeks and weeks and weeks trying to explain this to college students, and they sometimes don't get it. So if you've gotten something, you're doing more than they have. And may the Lord help them. One more thing about music. Music has certain elements, and they're put in a certain order, to, I think, to please the Lord. So it's not about music just being good or bad based on personal taste of, I don't like it. It's, it's, it's got too much of this, too much of that. That's just subjective. I'm tired of saying it's good or bad based on what I like. That's all the music. That's all it gets to most of the time, and you can't convince anybody of anything. Good or bad music is really whether it honors God's rules for music. But one thing we know for sure, if you want to make a difference in people's lives, just ask them, is the sound, how's the sound influencing you? And you can admit to them, I know this song not necessarily meant to be in church or take you closer to the Lord, but does it pull you away from him? Would you agree there's music out there like that that's the sound of it would make you think and act and maybe even behave in a way that would pull you away from God? There is music like that out there. Music that's very sensual, very fleshly, it's all it's there. We have to be careful. How are you going to know what to do? God will lead you if you if you'll give yourself to him, submit yourself to him. If you'll sit at his feet, you'll be able to make decisions. One more thing. Music, I believe this that music should match the message. You know, uh, it'd be, if we if we came and sang, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy. His when we all get to heaven. It's not quite the way we sing that song, is it? That's the way I sang it doesn't match the message. And the and even the music does. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. My eyes are open. Wow. Sing in the mansions bright and blessed. He prepared for us a place when we all get to heaven. It's happy. Matches the message. I am a poor wayfaring stranger. Traveling through this world of woe, but there's no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go. That's in the minor key. The words say I'm a poor, <laughs> wayfaring stranger. That's, those kind of words should be in the minor key. You know, songs doesn't have to be completely depressing. I'm going there to see my Savior. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm just a go. Here he is going over Jordan. Whoops. I'm just a going over home. In the minor key, that song's appropriate, but we wouldn't sing when we all get to heaven in the minor key. But music needs to match the message. Now, what is our message as Christians? I've got to stop. It's the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death, sad. Burial, sad. Resurrection, happy. A lot of our music is going to be a little more reverent in church. I don't think every song you have in your iTunes collection has to be that way. But I'm saying use some of the things I've told you today. The word's easy. I really think that. But make sure you're lined up with Christ. But the sound, it's influential. And make sure... Please make sure it's not drawing you away from the Lord. And you know what? I know God will help you. Now, there's coming a time very soon where nobody's going to fuss at you about your music. Nobody. I won't be around. You're saying, thank the Lord for that. Your parents won't be around. You're saying, now thank the Lord for that. But you'll find yourself calling them a lot and talking to them a lot. In fact, while I've been here today, my father tried to call me, and I can't wait to get out and talk to him. I love. He's, he's one of my best friends, maybe the best friend I have outside of my wife. So I appreciate his influence. But. That sounds crazy to you, but it'll happen to you too. But just make up your mind to honor the Lord, and he'll help you with it. If you have a question, I'll be around afterwards. I wanted to have some questions before we finish, but I've taken a little extra time. I hope I've helped you a little bit, and I want you to know that the Lord wants you to be free. Have liberty, but he wants you to do the right thing. One thing is for sure, Romans fourteen twelve says that every one of us shall give account of ourselves unto God. So when you get before the Lord, you won't be able to say, well, Lord, the music made me do it. <laughs> you say, well, you're the one that chose the music. Well, Mom and Dad said it was okay. Or, well, your Mom and Dad can't control your entire life forever. Know that the Lord loves you and he wants God's best for you. And if I can help you, please let me know. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time for people who are paying attention. 
and who've helped me. And we thank you for this opportunity to, to lift up thy name in Jesus' name. Amen.